Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for your children. Thank you for the love you give everyone. Members of this church and our invitees, our friends who are here. Lord, we are praying that as we come, you teach us yourself in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding. That we may see and behold wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that what we study will be something that will empower, energize, enable us to do what you have given us to do in Jesus' name. Be with us in the study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. We're back in Joel, when Joel chapter 2. You know we have studied Joel for some time. Already we have gone through seven studies in Joel. And tonight we come to study 8 in our study of Joel. We're looking at Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Joel has been prophesying, as you know, from chapter 1. And all through chapter 1 till this time, he's talked about actually many things. He's spoken about the disobedience of Judah and Israel. He has spoken about the consequence of that disobedience. That is the devastation, the destruction that came upon them. He spoke about the day of the Lord that was coming upon them. And it was a day of judgment. But then, he didn't end with just judgment. He told them, if they will repent, in fact, he said, if they will seek the Lord with weeping and crying and seeking the face of the Lord with fasting and praying, that everything will turn around, he will change. And I need to tell you, what he told Judah is telling every church. What he told Judah is telling every family and is telling every individual that whatever negative thing might have happened because of our sin, because of our disobedience, if we will turn to the Lord according to the promise of the Lord, if my people who are called by my name will seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, it says, I will hear from heaven. It says, I will forgive their sin and then I will heal their land. It's exactly the same thing Joel was telling the people of God. And then he began to tell them. He said in verse 22, chapter 2, be not afraid. And then he tells them in verse 23, Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. And then he begins to tell them he's going to give you the former rain, and he's going to cause even the latter rain to come upon you in the first month. In verse 24 he said, Even the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Have they lost anything? Are the canker worm and the caterpillars and the locusts, have they devastated their farms? And now farming was upon them. He said, don't worry about that. Things are going to change. In verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. A canker worm and a caterpillar and a palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Are we hungry? Are we, are we now lean because of the farming upon us? But he says the promise is coming. And in verse 26, we are going to eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. And then he said, ye shall know that I am the midst, I am in the midst of Israel. He will be in our midst. He will reign in our midst. He will do wonders once again in our midst in Jesus' name. And then he said, you will know that I am the Lord your God and none else. And he repeats it again, my people shall not be ashamed. And then it's after that he now gives the promise of the Spirit. And then he says, this one, there will be no exception. He's going to pour out his Spirit upon everyone. It shall come to pass afterward. That is, after that repentance. That is, after the fasting. That is, after the praying. That is, after seeking the face of the Lord. And when he begins to pour out his Spirit, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And to clarify what he means by all flesh, your sons and daughters, your old men as well, and the young men as well, the bond and the free, the servant 
and then the handmaids he said up oh, in those days i'll pour my spirit upon them as joel spoke about the pouring of the spirit upon all flesh first of all we need to understand that that prophecy will be fulfilled in stages number one he prophesied for the jews number two he prophesied for the gentiles he prophesied for the early church and he prophesied for the church in the latter days Actually, on the day of Pentecost, God began to pour out a spirit upon all flesh, upon the people that were saved, because Jesus said, Rejoice not because the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They were saved. And they were sanctified because Jesus prayed for them. And he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And remember what Jesus said? He said, Father, I thank you because you hear me and you hear me always. Then he told these people who were saved, these people who were sanctified, wait. For the outpouring of the Spirit, the fulfillment of the promise of the Father. And so they were praying and waiting. And the day of Pentecost came. And when that day of Pentecost came, the prophecy of Joel was fulfilled for them. How do we know the prophecy of Joel was fulfilled for them? Because that's exactly what uh, Peter said when he rose up and began to talk to the people in Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That's what we're looking at today. We're beginning today with the initial ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit means a lot to the church. Means a lot to every believer. And therefore, we don't want to rush over and just go through those two verses and then run on to other verses. That's why we're going to take some time and look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Today, we're just looking at the initial ministry. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, conviction for sin by the Spirit. Conviction for sin by the Spirit. Number two, the conversion of sinners by the Spirit. Number three, Christian character produced by the Spirit. We come back to number one. Conviction for sin by the Spirit. I want to remind you that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples. Upon the apostles, not only the apostles, apostles plus the disciples, because there were 12 apostles. But the Holy Ghost came upon all the 120 that were waiting. We're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sun from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them, clothing tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. Notice the word all. All the 120 that were waiting. There were some other people, believers, who were not there. But it didn't come upon the people that were not there. All the people that were waiting, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. But please don't forget. Jesus Christ had told his own disciples. Ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem. In all Judea. In Samaria. And then unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Spirit came upon them. So as to make them ministers of the world. And the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And it's to make you a minister of the word. And remember, it's for sons and daughters, for my servants and for my handmaids. It's for our brothers and it's for our sisters. And when the Holy Ghost comes upon us, he equips us to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's initial ministry? It brings conviction upon the sinners. Well, that Holy Ghost upon Peter, boldly, courageously, he stood up and he began to talk in verse 14. But Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah and all that dwell at Jerusalem. That's why Jesus said they will begin that ministry when the Holy Ghost came upon them. Be this known unto you 
hearken unto my words. Then he began to preach unto them. He applied the word to them. And as he applied the word to them, remember, these Jews were hardened in their sins. And without the power of the Holy Ghost, nobody could have brought them under conviction. Remember, they were so hardened that they even said they were ready to bear the consequence of crucifying Christ. They said, come what may, let come on us what may. In fact, they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They were bent on doing evil. But then Peter preached unto them a direct message. He confronted them with their sin. And see what the Holy Ghost did, bringing them to conviction. In verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made this same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, Now, when they had heard this, they were preached, they were convicted, they were condemned in their heart, the fire of the word burnt in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. He, he confronted them with the word. They were to repent. The point is, when the Holy Ghost comes, He convicts sinners of their sins. The Holy Ghost indwells you. The Holy Ghost saturates you. And then you begin to preach. And even though those sinners are hiding, the Lord will use your word. The Spirit of God will take your word and convict them of their sin. That's exactly what Jesus had promised that the Holy Ghost will do when he comes. In John chapter 16, reading from verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you. It's profitable for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, if I go, I will send him, not it, I will send him, is the third person of the Trinity, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment of sin, because they believe not on me. That is, because they have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, their sins have not been forgiven, their sins have not been cleansed. They have not become new creatures in Christ. They were still living in sin. So, the Holy Ghost possessed man. The Holy Ghost baptized sister. Can preach the word. And preaching the word, conviction will come upon those people. It's not the brother doing it. It's not the sister doing it. It's the Holy Ghost in that brother. The Holy Ghost in that sister. It will convict them of sin. Because they have not believed. It will convict them of righteousness. Because I go to my father and you see me no more in verse 11 of judgment because the prince of the world of this world is judged. And so the promise that Jesus had given that when the Holy Ghost comes, conviction will come upon sinners as uh, uh, the, the message of the word of God comes unto them. Let's understand. We have the ministry of soul winning. And we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But don't you understand that the sinners are hardened? And therefore, if you just go in your own strength, if you go in your own knowledge, if you go in your own power, you'll not be able to do a lot. Very often we see sinners, they go on in their sin without feeling the shame or the sorrow for their sin against God. Many are even gospel hardened. They've heard it before, they've seen it before, they've read it before, and they've even seen believers who are living the righteous lives, but it doesn't touch them. They have heard the gospel so many times, yet they continue in their sins. Those people dead in their conscience, and they had in their conscience. They refuse to consider the unbearable eternal consequence of their sin. You know what sin actually does? Sin builds hardness, a crust around the heart, and leads that sinner or leads the backslider to the point where the conscience is seared with a hot iron. Uh, open your Bible and see what sin does to the people. It will make you to see the seriousness of the task the Lord has given you. It will make you to see the importance of you receiving the Holy Ghost so that when you preach, the word of God will penetrate the stony heart, the hardened heart, the unbending, resisting heart, so that they will bend and yield to the Spirit of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. It is talking about the sinners that the Lord has sent us to. They are hardened. They don't want to listen. 
And yet, we need to preach to them. And we want to see them converted, brought to the Lord. How is that going to happen? By the Holy Ghost coming upon your life. And you preaching in the power, in the unction, in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Hebrews 3, 13. It says, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's what sin does to the sinners. You know, they commit adultery. And then their conscience might talk against them, protest against what they have done. But then uh, they do it again. They do it again. They do it again. Until there's a deceitfulness of sin that hardens their heart, hardens their conscience. And therefore they are not able to yield. And uh, it will be going on and on until they are going very near unto destruction. And then God sends you to them. But remember, as God sends you to them, uh, you talk. And if you are not talking the power of the Holy Ghost, they don't budge. They don't yield. They don't surrender. In Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 14. Proverbs 28 verse 14. Happy is a man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart. I, I read the scriptures to you that sin can harden the heart, but self can also harden the heart. He that hardeneth his heart. There are people that do it themselves. They just pretend as if they don't know the truth. They pretend as if they don't know that what they are doing is evil. Hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. But then, uh, you know, when a sinner gets to a point like that, and he deliberately hardens himself, you know how the Bible describes him? Look at it in Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7, reading from verse 12. Yea, they, have, they, have, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. That means they are adamant in their sins. They are bent on their doing evil. They say, yes, I know it's evil. Yes, I know that that's what the Bible says. But I'm bent on doing it. I enjoy it. I like to do it. And they take delight in their sin. Until uh, they can do nothing without even blinking their eye. They made their hearts as an adamant stone. Lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great trust from the Lord of hosts. Uh, that, that shows you then the condition of those people. Uh, the, 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 the hardness is caused by self on the one hand. It's caused by sin on the other hand. And then Satan sweeps in and he hardens them seriously. As they continually silence the protest of conscience. Those sinners harden themselves. And then the sin committed so often will conquer the heart, will harden the heart. And then to destroy that sinner... Satan will convince the sinner that evil is good. Evil is advantageous. And eventually, they will be so hardened that they just feel there's nothing you can do about it. It's only when you go to them in the power of the Holy Ghost, in the anointing unction of the Holy Ghost. And you open your mouth like this, and God directs the word as God directed the stone from the hand of David, striking at the very open spot in the head of Goliath. And then they come down. And then they come down saying, Oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me out of the body of this dead? Is the unction, the power of the Holy Ghost through you, through the preacher, through the evangelist or the soul winner that can do that. That's how the sinner gets convicted and his will is subdued. He feels a shame. He feels the sorrow for sin. The burden of sin leads him to fall before the face of the Lord, praying for the salvation of the Lord. Let's see some examples of how the Lord did that. In the New Testament. In Acts of the Apostles chapter, uh, chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Looking at it from verse 26. Acts 5. 26. Here we're told then. 5. 26. It says then. When the captain of the, the office. Well, the officers brought them without. Well, without violence. Uh, they feared the people. Lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them. They had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you, charge you, restrain you, uh, that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted, 
with his right hand to be a priest and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Even though they, they threatened them, terrorized them, they began to preach the word. Look at verse 33. When they had had that, they were caught to the heart. But then he took counsel to slay them. You see, uh, the conviction came upon them. Although they did not surrender, but yet uh, the conviction of the Holy Ghost actually came in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts 24, reading from verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and had him concerning the faith in Christ. And as a reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. And that's the effect when you preach the word of God in the power of the Holy Ghost. When you go out to evangelize, and before you go out, you pray. And you ask the Lord to fill you again. And like our members of the choir sang, and that the Spirit of God should fill us afresh. It should break us and melt us and mold us and fill us again. Spirit of the living God, fill us afresh. And when the Lord fills us afresh, we'll go out and as we preach the word, conviction will come upon the sinners in Jesus' name. We come to point number two, the conversion of sinners by the Spirit. Please understand, no matter how good we preach, how forcefully we preach, how, how fiery a message may be. It is not what we say. It is the Spirit of God that will grab and grip that sinner and draw him, drag him to his knees and begin to pray for the mercy of God. Bring conviction upon him. Make him to pray in faith until he gets converted. Conversion of sinners by the Spirit in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Reading there from verse 3. Here we see the action and the oppression of the Holy Spirit in bringing people to conversion. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How does that take place? That regeneration? How does that take place? That renewal of the Spirit? How does that take place? That transformation of heart and life? How does that take place? In verse 5, it says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, certainly, assuredly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, of the Spirit, born of the Spirit, except that happens, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, the natural birth, and is still all flesh. And the works of the flesh he will do, and the adultery and the fornication, and the fighting and the malice and the anger and the and the evil things will be there because he that's born of the flesh is simply flesh and it cannot go beyond flesh but that which is born of the spirit is spirit that's what makes him spiritual that's what brings the fruit of the spirit into his life and then in verse 7 marvel not that i said unto thee ye must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but thou canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. And so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. It tells us again that conversion, that regeneration, that transformation is by the power of the Spirit of God. And no doubt uh, David knew something about that. Because actually David had known the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord had been upon his life before. And then he did something unthinkable. He did something he shouldn't have done. He yielded his life into sin. He backslid. And then the Spirit of God again began to convict him. When, uh, when the prophet Nathan came to him and spoke to him, gave him a parable. But the prophet did it in the Spirit of the Lord. And even though he did it so gently, and he did it in such a parabolic manner with a parable, the conviction still came upon him because it was by the Spirit of God. And that's the reason he began to pray in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. It's because of the Holy Spirit. And actually, Nathan only spoke about one sin, but he now began to speak about transgressions. The Spirit of God reminded him. He fell on his knees, fell on his, fell on his face before the Lord. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my, my transgressions. 
and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and have done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified. When thou speakest, and be clear, when thou judgest, behold, I worship in iniquity. Nathan did not tell him that, but the Spirit of God told him that. The Spirit of God brought to his remembrance, he was shaped in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Thou desired truth in the inward parts. I didn't tell Urias the truth. I didn't tell a Job the truth. I dealt in possible and in the hidden part that shall not make me to know, make me to know wisdom. I was foolish. I did foolish things. Now I'm praying, purge me with his soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Is the spirit of God telling him, yes, you are dirty. Yes, you are unclean. Yes, you have gone far. But uh, the Lord will accept you if you come. And the Lord will wash you and cleanse you. He will not reject anyone. In fact, he will so wash you, you can be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which thou hast broken... Thou hast broken. It's not Nathan that has broken those bones. It's the Spirit of God. I know this is your work. I feel the fire. I feel the flame. I feel the burning sensation of the guilt and the condemnation I'm going through. I didn't feel this before until Nathan spoke and spoke in the power, the anointing, the unction of the Spirit of God. Now make me to hear joy and gladness so that these bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Had thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. He knew. He knew that's what he needed. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He said, restore me now. The joy of salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. He knew that conversion will come. Regeneration will come. Cleansing will come. Assurance of forgiveness and salvation will come again by the illumination of the spirit of the living God. The spirit of God is connected. If we want to see more conversions as we go out to preach or as we stay on the pulpit and we're speaking to the people who want those Gentiles, the people that do not know the Lord, the people that are living in darkness, we want them to be converted to cry to the Lord, become new creatures in Christ. You know what we need? We need the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Because actually, you understand, sorrow for sin, which is another, another term for conviction, can only come as the Spirit of God will show the sinner that his evil deeds are exceedingly sinful. It's that sorrow for sin that worketh repentance to salvation. With such conviction, the sinner will cry out, O wretched man that I am. And you know, before he'll be saying, I'm not too bad. Before the Spirit of God convicts him, he'll be saying, after all, what have I done that others have not done? Before the Spirit of God convicts him, he'll say, after all, my good works are better than my evil works. But when the Spirit of God comes upon, comes upon the believer that preaches the gospel, and then this believer is used as an instrument in the hand of the Holy Ghost, this man begins to cry out, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I merit what I'm going through. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? It's at this point that the Holy Ghost leads that sinner to begin to pray and then teaches him how to pray. You remember that song? Oh, happy day, happy day. And when he saved me and washed away my sin, he taught me how to watch and pray. It's the Holy Ghost that does that. After all, we know not what we should pray for or how we should pray. But the Spirit of God himself groaning within us and making us to grow. Grown, making us to pray. A kind of prayer which we knew not before. That Spirit of God leads us to pray weeping with a broken heart, seeking peace with God and pardon from the Lord. He does not only pray for forgiveness, the Spirit of God makes him to hate even the sins he had committed before. And then he begins to pray for grace and spiritual power so that he will not continue in those sins anymore. It's while the sinner is praying like that, the Spirit of God will begin to bring the promises of a God in his heart. He will just remind him, just seek the Lord. Call upon his name and return to the Lord because the promise of the Lord is let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. It's the spirit of God that will be reminding him the sacrifices of God a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart of God thou shalt not despise. 
It's the spirit of God that will remind that man, keep on praying. Seek the Lord. You are broken for your sin. You are humble because of your sin. You are convicted because of your sin. To this man will I look, even to him that is born of contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. And it's the spirit of God that will make him to begin to have faith in the, in the promises of the Lord. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise reject. It's the spirit of God that will say, come. Because the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And he that is a thirst, let him come unto me and take up the water of life freely. While the spirit of God is doing that, the man, you know, the body is being lifted. Eventually, he looks to Calvary by faith. And he says, Lord, forgive me. I will not do that again. Forgive me. Give me the strength. And everything you want me to make, he will not know when he begins to say all those things. Then the spirit of God changes his heart. Makes him to be converted. And the spirit of God bears witness with him that his sins are forgiven. Now he has the peace of God. Assurance that he will no more be judged for the sins he has committed anymore. Now he's converted. He becomes a new creature in Christ. He is enabled by the power of the spirit of God to come and live in newness of life. It's the spirit of God that does that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading there from verse 5. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, For our gospel came not unto you in what only. If it's what only, that's our intellect. If it is what only, that's our ability. Eh, we will learn the Bible, we've known the Bible, we will know the verses. If it's in what only, eh, that's just our human effort. But it says the gospel we pray did not come to you in what only, but also in power. And in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. What was the effect? What was the result of that word of God going in the power of the Holy Ghost to the Thessalonians? And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost. They were converted. And so ye became, ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. You see, they were converted because the, the word of God came to them in the power of the Holy Ghost. And to wait for his son. Now they were waiting for the son of God from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. So then we understand. Conviction comes upon the sinner by the Holy Ghost. Conversion takes place in the life of the sinner. By the Holy Ghost. Now that he is converted. How does he live a Christ like life? Christian character. A kind of behavior that glorifies the Lord. That shows that truly, indeed, this fellow has known the Lord. Again, the Spirit of God continues to work. Uh, do you see what the Lord is teaching us? That from the very point where you hear the word of God, conviction is by the Holy Ghost, conversion by the Holy Ghost, Christian character by the Holy Ghost, purity and purity of heart by the Holy Ghost, holiness by the Holy Ghost, and then the endowment of power by the Holy Ghost, the gifts to heal the sick and make you an effective minister of the gospel by the Holy Ghost, to live your Christian life and live victoriously by the Holy Ghost, to prepare you for the coming of the Lord when the latter rain will come upon the waiting bride to prepare us for the coming of the Lord also by the Holy Ghost. You see what the Holy Ghost does in our lives? Point number three. Christian character produced by the Spirit. Christian character produced by the Spirit. A true Christian character is the fruit of the Holy Ghost. Human efforts alone cannot make us as Christ-like as we ought to be. As righteous as we ought to be. As godly as we ought to be. It takes the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit. That's the Christian character. And the thing that comes out in the Christian life. That others will see you and marvel at your life. And I, I, I want to have what you have. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit. That's the solution. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, 
peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self control. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh by the power of the Spirit of God dwelling in us with the affections and the laws. If we, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And you see how the Spirit of God is exalted here? Do you see here that if we are going to live the victorious life, uh, you are praying, God, help me to love. Help me to love. The Spirit of God will come into you and fill you and saturate you and make you to love. Give me joy. The joy of the Holy Ghost, which is your strength, is by the Holy Ghost too. And the peace that passes understanding. You understand? Peace with God because your sins are forgiven. Peace in God because you are walking in, in, the, in the promises of the Lord. And the peace of God that just girds you, protects you. That even though there might be storms around you, the peace is there. It's by the Holy Ghost, long-suffering, perseverance, patience. That's by the Holy Ghost. It, maybe you are not happy with yourself because you are impatient. And, and you see that. You say, I, I don't like the way I am. I'm not patient enough with my wife. I'm not patient enough with my husband. I'm not patient enough even with my friends. I'm not patient enough with fellow believers. The Holy Spirit will do it in you. And he will do it tonight in Jesus' name. Gentleness. I, I, I see brother so and so the way he's gentle. And I just covet that I just like to be gentle like himself. I see sister so and so. Nothing you do to her ever bothers her. And she's so gentle. And she's patient with us. She's patient with people. I like that kind of gentleness and goodness and kindness. The way he cares and the way she cares. I want that. The Holy Ghost will give it to you. And faith of fidelity of faithfulness. Meekness. You know, just like a sheep. You're just following the Lord. And temperance, that self-control. Controlling my tongue, I like to do that. Controlling my body, I need that very much. And controlling my eyes, I need that very much. It's the Holy Ghost that will affect that in our lives. Because you see, all those things are the fruit of the Spirit. And when you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, it will produce Christian character in your life and in my life. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit... It's in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And you want righteousness. And you want all goodness. I want to be better than I am. And I want to do good to all people without discrimination unconditionally. I just want to love people, even the unlovable. I just depend upon the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is able to do that and He will do it. In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Still talking about this Christian character. The, the victory over sin. Is, uh, if you see other people, they have the victory in their lives. And you're secretly wondering, how can I have that kind of victory? Come into a, more closer, a closer relationship with the Holy Ghost. And you'll find that. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The spirit. The spirit. That's the secret. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, it reminds us again it's as we walk after the Spirit. How do we walk after the Spirit? He's living in us and He'll be directing us. So, oh, my child, you're a child of God. A child of God doesn't do that. Yes, Lord. And then a child of God wouldn't go that way. Yes, Lord. Anything you want to do, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Lord, can I do this? No, not now. Yes, Lord. Uh, can I go that? Yes, you can go now. Yes, Lord. Uh, somebody offended me. I want to reply him like this so that he will not do that. Thing. No, don't do that. Be quiet this time. Yes, Lord. You see, as a walk in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God in you, directing you, and leading you, and instructing you, teaching you, and you're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And that, 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 that's how you have the victory in your life. I said the Spirit of God instructs us. Uh, look at that phrase in Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, we're reading verse uh, 20 there, uh, and see the oppression and the action of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer. Nehemiah 
chapter 9, verse 20. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. You are born again, even though you might not even be baptized in the Holy Ghost now, because you are born again, the Spirit of God in a measure dwells in you. And he is the one that will be reminding you of scriptures. Don't you remember? Forgive one another, forgive the offenders 70 times, 7 times. Don't you remember? God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. Is the Spirit of God reminding you every time, telling you how to deal with your friends and how to deal with your enemies. And then we're told in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading there in verses 7 and 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading verses 7 and 8. Here he tells us, For God has not called us unto uncleanness. No, he has not called us to uncleanness. We all know that. But unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God who has also given us of his Holy Spirit. That's telling you then that the Holy Spirit, as he dwells in us, as he saturates us, as he empowers us, as he anoints us, is the spirit of holiness. And then he'll be telling us, you're called to holiness, don't do that. You're called to holiness, don't think like that. You're called to holiness, don't dress like that. You're called to holiness, don't, don't make that sinner uh, you know, a very close partner. You're called to holiness, don't love the world. It's the Spirit of God reminding us every time that we have a high calling, a holy calling, a heavenly calling. And it's that Spirit of God that just takes over our lives and it will be transforming us from glory unto glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, no exception, you my brother there today, you my sister there today, every one of us, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. I pray you'll see that glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory. It says that uh, when you are born again, uh, you have a level of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But then as you are born again and you are yielding to the Spirit of God, it takes you from one level of glory to another level of glory. Even tonight, it will take you higher in glory. It will beautify your Christian life. It will sharpen your Christian life. It will cleanse you better than before in Jesus' name. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that Spirit of the Lord is here tonight. It's right there by your side. Are you born again? Why don't you tell the Lord, take me to another level of glory? Or maybe you are not born again, and you want to be born again, and the Spirit of God is talking to your heart. Yes, Lord, I thank you, because you count my soul so precious and so important. And you are coming to me so that I can be converted. I yield, I surrender. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I make him my Savior. And my dear brother, there you are saved and you are sanctified. And you are not filled with the Holy Ghost yet. The Holy Ghost says there. He says, open the door, open the door, open the door. I want to come in. I want to fill you. I want to empower you. I want to saturate you. Or maybe you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And say, Lord, I want to be effective in evangelism. I want to be effective in soul winning. I want you to just saturate me and possess me that when I preach the word, sinners will be convicted and sinners will pray until they are born again. The Holy Spirit is available for everyone today. Available for everyone today. He will take your life, beautify your life, and turn you from glory unto glory. Call on the Lord. Call upon the Lord. He will do what you want him to do. The spirit of holiness will make you holy. He will purify you. He'll change your life. He'll energize you. He'll make you stronger. Strong in the spirit and in the might. He will help you. Call upon him. He will not refuse you. I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh.